Okay, next, next up we have Sandra Fluck. Am I doing that right or Fluke? It doesn't matter. Sandra doesn't matter is coming. No. Um, Sandra, it does matter. It does. Uh, Sa Sandra, please come up and we'll uh, start the, uh, with your opening statement. Thank you. Sandra, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just because it seems to be a source of consternation, it's Sandra Fluk. It rhymes with look. Okay. My mom was a, a public school kindergarten teacher and she would tell all of her students, my name is Mrs. Fluk. It rhymes like book because I like to read. And the, so all the kids who went to school in our school district knew how to pronounce our name. Um, some of you may, may know a little bit about me, but I, I want to share with you more. Uh, you probably know that I was thrust onto the national stage in 2012, uh, but I want you to understand how I got there. Uh, I've been working for about 10 years now as an advocate for progressive legislation on a range of issues, everything from gay rights where I co-founded a statewide coalition that got legislation passed ending discrimination against gay folks trying to access family court to, of course, a lot of reproductive justice work. I'm best known for standing up for the Affordable Care Act's women's health preventative care provisions and taking on even Rush Limbaugh about that. Um, yeah, I know, Rush. <laughs> you guys are a fan of Rush, really? <laughs> Um, but I've worked on a variety of issues, um, also a lot of economic justice concerns. I've worked extensively with low-wage workers, fast food workers, hotel workers, fighting for a living wage, and also addressing child poverty here in California. This past fall, I was very proud that after over two years of work with a grassroots coalition, uh, I was able to see the governor sign the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights, a bill that is one of the first in the country. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, one of the first in the country to ensure labor protections for domestic workers that the rest of us take for granted. That's the Thank you. That's the kind of progressive legislation I want to fight for in Sacramento because I know that here in California, we can be a model for the rest of the country. We're already showing that, that we can turn our economy around based on progressive change, but we can do so much more. My priorities in this campaign are making sure that we take a strong stance protecting our environment. I, of course, care deeply about c protecting the Biona wetlands. Thanks for being here, ladies. Um, I have been speaking out against fracking, against offshore drilling, about what we need to do to prepare for global climate change. I'm also really prioritizing education, early childhood education, as well as affordability at the higher education level. And I think if you ask just about anyone in any district, including ours, what they want their government to do better, it's that they want to create a better economic future for all of us. And so that would have to be one of my priorities, is making sure that we have the kind of good paying jobs that our students are training for and that all of us rely upon. I look forward to going to Sacramento to fight for all of you, to be an independent voice and, and stand with all of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, move on to questions here. Uh, you mentioned higher ed. Uh, CSU and UC funding remains near their lowest levels in, in decades, tuitions uh, at historic highs, uh, and, and it's probably going to drive increases in student debt. So uh, you say you're, you're, uh, this is a, a, an important topic for you. Yeah. What more can the state do uh, for higher education, and, and it, does it go beyond just simply fund and throwing m more money at the problem? Is it more, more, is it more than funding? Well, I think funding is really the, the basis of it. You know, I was speaking with a, a recent CSUN graduate right before we got started here, and we were talking about the protests that have happened on campuses every year. We, in the last five years, tuition across the California system has doubled. That's unacceptable. That's putting all of the burden of our future economic gains that the rest of us will have from all of these students in their professions entirely on them and their families and strapping them with nationally a trillion dollars worth of debt. 
When that bubble bursts, it's going to be far worse than when the housing bubble burst. So we all have to take this issue very seriously because it has consequences for each and every one of us. That's why I'm proud that I worked with an organization here in Los Angeles called Young Invincibles that tackles these issues directly. We look at the, these kinds of concerns and on specifically on funding for higher education, making sure that we fund it is a big part of, of the answer. Uh, we have the ability to do this. We have revenue coming back in. In the next few years, we'll be restoring to where we were before the cuts, but we have to go beyond that. And it sounds like that's a simple answer, but that's what's needed, is that we actually prioritize and make sure that the funding goes there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, do you support the, the governor's transfer of about 19% of the proceeds of cap and trade auction revenue to support the high-speed rail program? And do you support the high-speed rail build-out, which should begin later this year from San Francisco to Los Angeles? Uh, I am very focused on what happens with the cap and trade revenues that are coming into the state. We're just starting to, to see them, and it's critical that we make sure they were used for their intended purpose, which is preventing global climate change and protecting all of us from the, the parts of it that are unavoidable because we've waited too long. Now, on high-speed rail, I think transportation generally is one of the things that we can do to try to lessen our impact and our reliance on fossil fuels. That's why I'm committed to expanding transit options around Los Angeles. High-speed rail, I believe, is one of the things we need for our future, but I'm very concerned about the way the state has been just wasting our money on this project and not fiscally managing it appropriately. So I think it is an okay use of cap-and-trade funds, but we need to see from the state that it's going to be done correctly before we allocate the money there. Okay. Uh, so despite Prop 30, the lowest income families in California still pay the largest share of their incomes in, in, in state and local taxes. Mm -hmm. How do we alleviate this disparity and create a more progressive tax code? Well, in comparison to other states, we actually are less regressive some, for, than other states, so that's good that we have a, a good starting place. But the absolute biggest thing we have to do to fix our tax code is we have to reform Prop 13. We all know this. It's just that we need the political will to do it. So we need a split role. We need to stop acting like corporations are people throughout our entire legal system, but on taxes too. Corporations are different than people who own their own homes. So we need split role. We need to assess uh, differently when they change property and close that corporate loophole. And we need to stop saying that taxation is the kind of decision that takes two-thirds, but every other type of law we make is not very important, and that can only be a majority. All of our laws in this, in this state are important, and taxation is the key to achieving so many of our priorities. So reform of Prop 13 is one of my highest objectives. I think, I think we're all in agreement on that. So far, it's come up three times. Uh, so you mentioned uh, uh, the, the power of corporations, the power of, uh, uh, in, in, particularly in Sacramento. Is public financing an answer to control the power of money? And while we see public financing schemes in places like Connecticut and Arizona, can it be effective amid the continued presence of Citizens United and the further chipping away at campaign finance laws from the Supreme Court and the idea that you can do an independent expenditure campaign and, and all the public financing in the world might not make a difference? Well, I think what it has to be is not just public financing, but public financing in a way that uh, incentivizes and brings out public individual public involvement in the process. So New York City has a very interesting system that's working pretty well there, where if you get small dollar donations, um, I don't remember, the, I think it's $50 or very small dollar donations, those are matched by the public system up to a certain limit. And that not only brings some of that public financing in, uh, dilutes the power of corporate money, but it also ensures that citizens are more involved in electing their representatives. But we need to go beyond that. We need to have public financing for the kinds of communications with all of you that are necessary. And this, I have to say, is really a question of our will as voters because voters are the ones that are standing in the way on this particular reform. We all want money out of politics, 
but we hesitate about using public money to make sure that voters are informed about their choices. So I would fight for this, but I'm the kind of legislator who knows that change happens when an entire community comes together to make that change happen. So I would need all of you working with me to accomplish this one. Okay, great. All right, to, to wrap up, uh, this is a healthcare question. Um, since uh, 2011, although it was just uh, uh, actually enacted in the last year, uh, there's been a 10% cut to providers under Medi-Cal. And there's a lot of concern that this reduces access for low-income beneficiaries. Do you uh, support rolling back that 10% cut? And uh, if so, uh, how do we balance that with the other health care needs uh, within the state? It gives away the answer when I nod while he's talking. Yeah, right? it does. Um, yes. One of the, even before the 10% cut to Medi-Cal reimbursement rates, we were one of the lowest states in the country on our level of Medi-Cal reimbursement. And that may seem like that's not a big deal, but you have to remember that that means that doctors can choose not to accept Medi-Cal, to just turn those patients away. And this is happening at a time when we are rightly expanding Medi-Cal, having more and more folks in our society have access to health insurance coverage. So it's going to result in a severe shortage. It's already become a problem. We have to roll back the cuts, but we have to go beyond that and really invest in these reimbursement rates because it saves the state money in the long run. We want preventive care to be available rather than folks to be relying on emergency rooms down the line. But there is a lot more to be done around health care investment. I agree with with a speaker earlier who was uh, discussing the importance of undocumented immigrants being able to buy into covered California. One of the most disturbing trends in legislation we've seen recently is telling people which kinds of health care they can and cannot buy with their own money. Let me just repeat that. Which kinds of health care you can buy with your own money. If you want to have insurance coverage that covers comprehensive reproductive services, you should be able to have access to that. If you want to buy insurance in our public market in California, your documentation status should not stop you from doing that. Okay, great. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to continue with uh, Betsy Butler. And Betsy, you'll have three minutes for your opening statement. There you are. There you go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am honored to be here today. Uh, I've been on the stage many times, um, fighting with all of you for the next great um, progressive candidate that we have had here in the neighborhood. We've all been working together um, for a long time to get great people like Deborah Bowen and um, uh, Bill Rosendahl and Mike Bonin elected. So it's an honor to be here um, with you all. And I just say early, um, thank you for your support of my past election uh, when I did serve in the legislature, um, representing this fabulous area that I've lived in for 26 years. Um, we did get to accomplish a lot together. I would like to go back to the legislature to continue to work on the items I worked on uh, while I was there. I did get 14 bills signed by the governor, uh, mainly prioritizing veterans, elders, uh, com consumer product safety, and environmental issues. I also got four more bills to the governor that um, he didn't sign, focusing on veterans' courts and on our farm workers, uh, making sure our farm workers have shade and water rights. And I want to go back and continue those battles because they still exist. There are still people um, in this state who are not being represented who do not have a voice in Sacramento who do not have million dollar lobbyists to take care of them. So I would like to go back to work um, on their behalf and on your behalf. I'm honored to have been a very active community member. I currently sit on the board of Planned Parenthood here in Los Angeles. I'm also on the board of the Redondo Beach Veterans Memorial Task Force. I'm on the board of Peace Over Violence on Equality California's board. I've been on Equality California's board for eight years, um, working to make sure that every human being is treated uh, with fairness and equality, and I want to go back to Sacramento to continue that work because it's not done yet. Um, I'm honored to have incredible endorsements like former Secretary, uh, Labor Secretary Hilda Solis, um, Dolores Huerta, um, Senator Fran Pavley have endorsed me, and I'd like to go back and work with them because a lot of the legislation that we're addressing here in California and the needs that we need uh, to make sure are um, addressed very soon are very comprehensive. Um, they require a lot of collaboration, and they're going to be um, really, truly life-saving 
or life-sustaining measures, including our water crisis, including our elder care uh, situation. We're learning more and more about the veterans that are coming home and their needs every single month. Um, the, the needs that women need um, addressed upon their return, their homelessness, their PTSD, their, um, their military sexual trauma. These are issues that are going to greatly affect this state. We have more veterans um, in this state than any other. They're young and they have uh, specific needs. So I want to go back to Sacramento to work to make sure that we make California as, as progressive and as prosperous as possible. And um, working with everyone um, in the room who are out there doing the hard work, I know that we will be um, re really, really, really um, um, committed to making sure that our voices are heard, heard here. Um, I was the first person to uh, introduce a moratorium on fracking and want to, <laughs> want to make sure that those of us in LA who have those kinds of ideas are actually heard in Sacramento. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll start with this. Um, the share of corporate income that's paid in taxes in California uh, from 1981 to 2011, that's been cut in half. Uh, from about 9.5% to, to almost uh, a little less than 5%. Uh, that's not just because of Prop 13. So what other than Prop 13 uh, would you seek to restore the level of corporate taxation in, in California? Well, business, particularly small business, is Im imperative to our state's success. Um, but Corporations need to close. Sorry, corporations need to close uh, loopholes um, all over. We were able to uh, make sure that that uh, we got the Middle Class Scholarship Act passed um, through the legislature. Unfortunately, the governor did not sign it. Um, dealing with uh, taking down our the cost that we pass on to those who go to um, higher higher education here in California. So we need to close those loopholes. They're everywhere. Um, there are a lot of them, and. And just because you're a corporation doesn't mean you should have special dispensation. You um, need to pay your fair share. I've been an, an active um, proponent of fairness and equality my entire life, whether it's businesses or um, the LGBT community, whatever. The fact is the corporations are no, are no different. They need to pay their fair share. They need to be um, good citizens, good neighbors, and, and good uh, funders for the state. Great. Thank you. What is your position on the Bayona wetlands and the proposed development by the Annenberg Foundation on the site, which would significantly alter the ecological reserve? And, and if elected, what uh, can you lend to the effort uh, to, to ensure your position uh, prevails? You know, we are blessed to have uh, wetlands. Unfortunately, they are, they are disappearing at a rate that is actually very unhealthy. And when we have um, the high waters that are going to be coming to us, um, we're going to really rue the day that we did not take care of, of them more and make sure that more of them were, were left here. But um, we need to make sure that the, the wetlands are um, a vital, active, um, growing part of our community. And I, I want to make sure there are a number of plans that are being considered right now um, for the Bayona wetlands. There's been no decisions, including one that says we'll do nothing. Um, we, we will just leave it the way it is. So that is working through the process. But I want to make sure that our wetlands are are strong um, and that they are preserved. Um, I'm actually fighting in the marina. There's most of the marina has been built out. There is a portion of the marina. Um, it's 9U that will have a small wetland on it and then a huge hotel next to it. And right now, I'm fighting um, with local uh, residents here that we've been fighting all the development in the marina for a long time, um, just to have some rational development because it's it's so much. Um, it's very dangerous if there's an issue here, we're not going to be able to get out of the marina. But there's one particular situation where um, the Coastal Commission actually approved a 28-foot fire lane going onto the wetland as opposed to the hotel side. So we are fighting that. And, and it's been going through the courts for a year. Um, I'm hopeful that we're successful, but we just want little wins. So um, anything I can do to help all of our, our wetlands be stronger, I'm happy to, to um, be the leader of that fight. Okay. Uh, you're, you're someone uh, uh, who has actually been uh, in Sacramento, and so uh, maybe you have a special insight on uh, what is happening up there where we see these three members suspended for the first time in, in, this, in the state's history. Uh, do you think that there, is, there are measures that can be taken to uh, you know, limit the, the 
frankly, corruption that we're seeing in, in Sacramento and, and, and restore uh, some more uh, accountability and confidence uh, among constituency. Uh, those of us who, who did, um, who have served together, I served as every one of the members who has been um, tarnished. And I can tell you, that's not why I got into public service. I started uh, my career in public service uh, with Lucy Calais, an assembly member from San Diego. I worked for Bill Clinton. I worked for um, Leo, Leo McCarthy when he was lieutenant governor. Uh, these are good people who want to do good things. And um, when scandals like this happen, I can say it is a minority. Of, of the people. I've talked to many of my former colleagues since it's happened and, and, and no one knew any of this was going on. I mean, it, you know, I, the fact that this happened to Leland Lee is, is an, an incredible shock. I can't even imagine it. Um, but it does come down to money and it comes down to uh, fundraising. And we need true campaign finance reform in this state. I know that we, you asked the question earlier about public financing. And the fact is, is that remember, we had an initiative that would have publicly financed our Secretary of State's election, and the, and the electorate of California didn't support that. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do on this issue, but we need to have true finance reform. And that means, you know, not figuring out when the, when the laws are set, how you get around it by 527s and IEs and all those things. Literally, how are we going to how are we going to make sure that the money that comes in is, is truly um, um, legal and that we know where it's coming from and that the intent of that money and the people who are involved, um, that everyone knows that the transparency is there. Um, we're trying to do a lot more sun of, of sunshine laws in Sacramento. We worked on a number of them when I was there, and we need to do a lot more, obviously. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about your, your uh, position in uh, this intra-party debate that we've seen around education reform, things like charter schools and uh, pay for performance for teachers and restrictions on tenure and things of that nature. Uh, uh, you know, what is your position in this debate and what are some areas in, in, where you think the current education system falls short and where we need to uh, make improvements uh, to the education system? Well, here's what's devastating. First of all, if you ask anyone about um, how we're going to fix education in the state of California, everyone can say it's not working, but that's pretty much where it ends. Um, there's not a lot of agreement. But having come from, my mother was, worked for the California Teachers Association for 34 years. I was raised in public schools, um, both elementary through um, higher education. And the fact of the matter is, is that we need to make sure our public schools are funded. I got to walk to school. I... Um, I had music in school, I had art, I had counselors, I had nurses. It was like a real healthy place to be, and times have changed, but we've got to get back to that. And um, let me join the chorus of Prop 13 is, is, you know, is the cause of it. Uh, what we see now with our public school education system is, is what Prop 13 has wrought after 40 years, right? This is what it looks like, folks. And so people want a good education. Um, and if you're in a lower uh, socioeconomic area, you're going to go to a charter school or wherever it is you can go because you've been written off. A lot of educational institutions have just written you off or, or, um, or leadership administration have written you off. And that's not fair either. So... Um, we have to make sure that teachers are paid what they're worth, that they have um, that they have due process, that they are encouraged and motivated to become stronger and, and teach the future of, of our of our state. Um, I'm also a huge supporter of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math is the answer for the state. We have to have more people educated in that level so that we can fill the jobs um, that California has coming uh, forward in the next two decades. Okay, thanks. There's finally a, a, a deal in place to restrict the uh, size of the prison population to 137.5% of capacity. That, that's what we're restricting it to, by the way. Um, the, the big problem is the fact that over the last 30, 35 years, almost every sentencing law that has been passed by the legislature has increased rather than reduced sentencing. Do we need a sentencing commission to roll back increases and uh, put low-level, nonviolent offenders in the treatment programs they often need rather than county or state lockups. Actually, corrections is uh, one of the main reasons I got involved in the veterans' work that I did, because um, in, in talking about the fact that we're spending much more money on corrections than we are on higher education is, is, a, is a crime in itself. And in working with um, 
the leaders in Sacramento, um, I really wanted to figure out how we could take out populations from the correction system. And veterans were an obvious one because we, we need special benefits for them. But women, most of the women who are incarcerated, um, this is coming from the uh, California uh, Correctional Police Officer Association, n you know, shouldn't really be there. We need to figure out how to get them out. But most importantly, um, we need to keep kids out and then we also need to invest in them when, if they do get incarcerated, we have to invest in them, rehabilitate them, and train them so that they're not there again. There are a number of bills. I supported SB 9 that says if you're a child and you um, commit a murder, sorry, you commit yeah. a murder, you commit a murder, um, that you can be considered to be, you won't be there for, if you get life without parole, that you can be considered again after you've served 15 years, if you can go through rehabilitation. So we need to figure out how to stop getting people in once they're in, getting them out, keeping them out, and investing in, in those who need help. And instead of putting it in more, building more prisons is not the answer. We know that what we're doing isn't working. We have to do something different. Um, I've been the leader of that um, with our veterans, and I want to continue doing that. I got three bills signed by the governor that address uh, veterans who have been incarcerated, and uh, we need to do more for them because they deserve it. All right. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Thank you. Right there. Okay. Now we're going to go to Barbie Applequist. And we'll hear from her for a few minutes. We are going to have time later for, for questions. Kelly Willis, ladies and gentlemen, our AV guy. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Hello. So you got three minutes right, and excellent. go right ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Barbie Applequist. I am very honored to be here today. Uh, thank you for inviting me and including me in this endorsement process. I am running because I have been a 14-year resident of this community. I moved here in 2000. I have raised a family here. I got married here. I've worked as a tech consultant and as an attorney here. Uh, and I was diagnosed with cancer and treated for cancer here. I'm running because I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the environment. I'm concerned about, she, she thank you. I'm following that gentleman. He's okay. giving me excellent direction here. All right. There we go. There um, go. I'm running because I'm concerned about the economy and I'm concerned about that buzzing noise. But uh, <laughs> it seems to be worse the further, maybe if I stay in right here. I don't know. No. All right, sorry, time's ticking. Okay, so I, and I'm concerned about uh, public safety. So just briefly, I'll talk to you about the things that, that I'm concerned and why I'm concerned about them. I have been part of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Is it better if I speak with your microphone? Why don't you try? All right. I think we should give Barbie a few extra seconds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, more. thank you. Oh my goodness, I don't know what it is. All right, well, I, I, can, I don't have to use a microphone either. I used to work in stage as a, in high school. Use this one then? This one? Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about the environment because as a runner, right, after I was diagnosed with cancer, I was encouraged to run. So I joined the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I'm part of team and training. I have uh, team members who ran the Hollywood Half Marathon today, and tomorrow I'll be running 12 miles around Marina Del Rey in Venice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you can do anything. Um, as a, so as a runner, you know, I've, I've been able to see how beautiful our coastline is. I went to high school in San Diego, so I, I've seen the coastline from Southern California. And, and running from the coastline, you know, in Santa Monica and Marina Del Rey in Venice, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. But the further south I go, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa, Rancho Palos Verdes, you start to see those oil platforms coming closer and closer to your coast. You also see the oil refineries. Right, those, those big pipes just coming out. And you also smell the sort of sewage system that's happening in Marina Del Rey. These are things that concern me. I, I don't think enough is happening in Sacramento that should be happening, enough to restrict oil platforms, enough to you know, restrict, ban our fracking. And I think that is, that's something that I want to focus on um, up in Sacramento. The other big issue is the economy, thank you. Uh, with respect to the economy, I have had uh, the great pleasure to research in depth the Film TV Tax Credit Incentive Program. Um, I've been published on some of the reforms that I think should be made to that program. It is one of our tax credits that work. For every dollar that goes into the tax credit, more than $1.11 to $1.31 is generated in additional tax revenues. We keep our jobs here, we keep our working class jobs here, we keep our families here, and we keep the businesses that rely on those individuals here. So that's a tax credit program that works and it can be used for other industries as well. Um, I also want to support the number of veterans who are currently you know, serving but will soon uh, be, become veterans and, and sort of re-enter civilian society. I think uh, additional tax credit could work uh, to support them. Thank you. Um, I also want to uh, find a way to 
create a you know, universal preschool to support Steinberg's current bill. Um, and then with just a few more seconds left to go, uh, I also believe that our communities need to be safer. Uh, with the recent release of the prison population, um, thank you, it has created communities that aren't as safe as they were before, um, and we also need better retraining programs. I'm happy to speak in more detail about any of those issues. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go without Did notes. Like Don't worry about it. All right, uh, all right. so uh, you mentioned uh, early release, right? right? So the early release is a function of the realignment of prisons that has moved from the state uh, down into county lockups where the county does not have the funds necessary. Do you think that's a moral solution to uh, how uh, the state can reduce its spending on prisons? I think it's a complicated issue, but first of all, I think our local communities are left with insufficient law enforcement to deal with this new population of, of individuals who are recently incarcerated, who haven't had the skill retraining that they need, um, and they're not getting the proper probationary support. I, at the same time, you know, I am I'm a Democrat. I, I practiced human rights law for a while, and I do think that you know, there's a certain amount of, of, sort of human rights protection that's required. So I understand legally the Supreme Court's mandate that we reduce our prison population, but I don't think it should have to go to the expense of our communities. Um, we also need to do a much better job about retraining, especially our younger offenders. I've had an opportunity to speak with people from Homeboy Industries, which is one of the, sort of the great uh, retraining programs, if you will, for former gang members. A lot of youth who have had to commit these crimes because that's sort of the culture that they were brought up in, but by giving them solid skills uh, in, in new jobs and giving them the support that they need, um, we're really able to see them sort of re-enter civilian society in a positive way. Uh, and I think also additional, uh, the alternative court systems like the homeless courts and the veterans courts. I've had an opportunity to work with Paul Fries from Public Council, um, who's a big supporter of creating those kind of programs. And I think that should be expanded and more supported throughout the state. So I think those are the sort of reforms that we need, not just a, a reduction to support the mandate from the Supreme Court, uh, but also solid programs. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, you mentioned the environment, the, the oil platforms and everything, and a lot of people have mentioned this oil extraction tax idea. Uh, is there a danger there that this sort of hooks uh, the state on revenue uh, gained by uh, activity that we actually don't want to see? Uh, is so should should we support an oil extraction tax or should we report support more more moratoriums on oil extraction in California? I mean, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I think in the short term it's both, right? Because we want to generate whatever tax revenue we can from the processes as they exist until we get to a better renewable source. Um, we need to invest those monies in renewable energy, like solar. Um, I think and wind. You know, those are where we should be putting those revenues. Um, and uh, you know. Ideally, we could stop everything now and, and be able to generate this alternative fuel um, program. But that's not how it happens. So I think, unfortunately, we do have to re temporarily rely on the tax revenue streams, but we have to make sure that the budget, thank you, is prepared to scale back on those revenues. Um, as many of you know, you know the economy is cyclical. And if we, on a budgetary basis, rely on, on prior income, prior revenue, to create programs for now and in the future, that's when we end up into a, a budget deficit. So hopefully we can plan better, which is what I hope to do up in Sacramento. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned before this issue of three million Californians who will remain uh, uncovered uh, by health care insurance coverage uh, even after the Affordable Care Act. Uh, what can we do at the statewide level to support uh, moving to a truly universal system where everyone gets the coverage they need? And what role do community health centers play in this, such as the proposal at the, at the county level uh, to use sort of a medical homes concept and, 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 and it, it sort of instruct people to go to various community health centers uh, and they get a set amount of money to care for those people and that's how you create universal health care? Uh, as a cancer survivor, I understand what it means to not have coverage. I understand what it means to fight for coverage, and I understand what it means to fight for care. Um, I, I do that for myself. I've done that for my family. And I, I don't think anyone should have to go through that experience, whether or not you have $5 or $5 million. Um, that being said, you know, I've worked at public council. My work there, I worked with community health activists, um, helping to create uh, community health centers with the nonprofits in our, in our communities, mostly in Koreatown and in South Central and sort of the undeserved area, underserved areas here in um, Los Angeles County. 
we need to be able to provide sufficient financial support to those community health centers. Right now, they rely a lot on uh, you know, foundation support, on private support, uh, by being able to support them at the community level, at the county level, but also at the state level. Um, you know, the three million, as you identified, who are currently uh, without insurance and are undocumented, um, there is the fear of self-reporting and how that might trigger immigration status. Even though it won't, right, the governor has said and, and the state has said it will not, there is still fear. And I think we have to be able to provide care in, in a way, like at the Venice Family Clinic, without people fearing, you know, if they have a cold or a fever or if they have cancer, they need to be able to get their care. So right. I support um, the community level. Excellent. Support. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so there are 58,000 homeless uh, in Los Angeles, of which 8,000 are vets. There's minimal affordable housing. More people, you know, are making minimum wage and, and, and can't afford housing in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area that is extremely difficult uh, to find affordable housing. SB 1818, which offers incentives for building low-income housing through, through density bonuses is a potential solution. Do you support that, and what would you do if elected to address the lack of low-income housing to, to get people off the streets? Well, I would support SB 1818 um, in its efforts to create and provide more affordable housing. Um, again, my work at Public Council, one of the projects within the Community Development Project was to uh, be part of the community's voice in fighting for uh, affordable housing for our community members. That being said, you know, having as a as a Santa Monica resident, you know, looking at some of the development that's been proposed, like at the Heinz Development Center, there there's just not sufficient work being done at the local level from our local government leaders to fight for those affordable housing points. You know, and a lot of the pieces is it is it a um, financially doable? Is it a, a financially viable position for the city um, to take? And I think from you have to have that support from the state level uh, to help. So you say this is a this is a priority that we have um, to support affordable housing units. We also need to find a better way of integrating our communities. Uh, I I don't want my daughter to grow up in a city or in a state where we have projects, right? I think it's unfortunate. I think there needs to be more integration. It shouldn't matter how much your parents make or what your friends' parents make. If you want to play together at the playground, play together at the playground. And I think that is the kind of communities that we need to build where people are integrating and they're working together and it's not just based on, on how much money you're making and what you can afford to live in. Okay. Uh, so this will be the last thing. You mentioned the film and, and TV tax credit. I, I, I work in the industry and, and it always strikes me that this is a, a giant race to the bottom that there are states all around the country that just give more and more and more to companies who are fantastically wealthy. Uh, uh, large conglomerates that uh, d don't really need credits uh, to, to do productions, uh, at least some of them. Certainly there's independent productions as well. Um, but what can we do outside of simply giving more and more and more money as it will escalate in sort of an arms race uh, to uh, maintain an industry that uh, has roots in, in this state? That's a great question. It's actually one of the questions that have been raised before when I talk about the film TV tax credit. Some of the additional proposals that can be made besides just extending the pool um, is by expanding the geographic scope which is to say, this needs to be a California-based film TV tax credit program. In order to get Northern California and San Diego to support the program and make it more robust, we have to make sure that we're incentivizing filming outside of LA. Now, I love LA, and I think a lot of film happens here, but it's possible to get down to San Diego in the morning and to come home by night. I know that for a fact, because my little sister and her husband, who's in the military, live in San Diego. So by finding a way to expand this and to incentivize it, which is it, it, the current um, AB uh, 1839, which is the, the new proposed film TV tax credit, it allows for uh, a higher tax credit incentive um, if you are filming outside of the LA 30 mile zone. So that's one piece. The second piece is by incorporating post-production, which currently is not in the current draft of the bill, but would I think be a great asset because one, you're also bringing in Northern California businesses, um, like high tech, uh, a lot of those post-production facilities, um, and also making, again, this California-based program. The third piece that I would do is I would... Um, uh, 
focus on independent film. Independent filmmakers are, are small businesses in the film industry. They're not your large studios who have shareholders from across the world. They are small businesses, and they are the businesses that rely on those small margins, and that's why they have to shoot in Louisiana or in Georgia. Just the other night, I was talking to a line producer, Katie Mustard, who has two films she has to shoot in New Orleans, and it's worth it to spend $200,000 on shipping people out there and hiring union members there, sorry, um, than it is for her to stay here because of, of her margins are so small. Okay. Well, thank you, Barbie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are going to wrap this up with 